Hello again. We're in the midst of our eighth lesson. You've heard eight lectures this semester. On six of those occasions, we ended the lecture with some sort of example, some sort of thing that would connect the concepts presented in the lecture with what you were expected to do in your homework and perhaps real life. In the inventory chapter, the lecture was mostly conceptual and we didn't work an exercise. So I did what I called a lecture extension, and that's what this episode is. I'm hoping that you're viewing this after lecture and before you're trying your first homework assignment. It's intended to help you with that. There's a handout available to you. It will help with um, going over this material. I'm hoping that you'll have that in your hand and use it effectively during this lecture, during this lecture extension. The topic this week is internal controls and cash. And the lecture, as I've already mentioned, was rather conceptual. It's all important material. Understanding the big picture is very important. But we've chosen some practical examples of that to demonstrate and let you get your hands on in the homework assignments. And one of those is about bank reconciliations. Bank reconciliations is important, are important for your company but could also be used as individuals. We should reconcile our bank statement on a monthly basis. We should always compare our records with the cash that we think we have in the bank with the bank's records. That's the advantage, one of the advantages of keeping cash in the bank account. So let's turn to the handout and read through, glance through this bit of information so that we can assemble and prepare a bank reconciliation ultimately. There's a lot of details in this, and rather than me reading it to you, I think that what I'd rather demonstrate is not so much a real-life way of accomplishing this, but the practicality of how would I approach this in this first upcoming homework assignment or in this handout. So one approach would be to read each of those items, A through H, and determine where they belong on a bank reconciliation. When we start placing things on a bank reconciliation, we figure out that there are four possible places to put them. It either goes on the bank side as an increase or on the bank side as a decrease. Or the item in question, the reconciling item, goes on the depositors or the company side, our side of the bank reconciliation as an addition or as a deduction. And perhaps you remember from lecture that everything that goes on a bank reconciliation is either a time lag or an error. So as we read through this material on the, the narrative presented in the handout, we need to decide on one of these four positions. Is it an increase or decrease on the bank side or an increase and decrease on the depositor side? Well. Not knowing how many lines to skip, not knowing the format, we really can't write it down on a bank reconciliation with this much information to process. So here's what I'm adding different in your thinking process. I'm asking you to think with me, to analyze with me, to decide with me in advance about each of these components listed in the directions. Let's just get us a piece of scratch paper. Let's jot down the decisions that we make about where to place these on the bank reconciliation. And then once we've done our planning, our thinking, our analysis, writing it, actually writing it in an acceptable format shouldn't be difficult at all. So let's consider each of the items. In the opening paragraph, it says that the balance according to the company's record, it's this first sentence, the balance according to the company's records is $14,691.80. So let's write that on one of these four positions. That would go on the company's records as an addition. That's where we're beginning. We're comparing that balance with the balance according to the deposit, the, the bank's records, excuse me, according to the bank statement. The opening paragraph says that figure is $19,913.90. That goes 
on the left side on the bank's records. Now, it's not magic that the bank's on the left and the company's on the right. That just so happens to be the way I wrote it down. So we've got these two balances that don't agree. And it's our job to get them to agree, to explain why they don't agree, and to see if we can come up with two balances that do agree at, after the end of our, our analysis. So now let's consider the items listed A through H on the handout. The first item says checks outstanding. Now these represent time lags. A time lag means that one party involved has already recorded it and the other party has not. That's the reason it's a time lag. When one party has and the other party has not, it's a time lag. If both parties have or neither party has, it's not a time lag. It's only when one has and the other has not that it's a time lag. Outstanding checks mean that we have already recorded them. We wrote them down. We decreased our cash account. The bank's not aware of them yet. They can't process them when they don't know about them. So these outstanding checks will be deducted when they get to the bank. In the meantime, we should write them on the reconciliation as a deduction on the bank's side. That figure, $7,070.10, is a reduction deducted on the bank's records. The second item on the list is a deposit of 49.4520 that had been made too late to appear on the bank statement. It's a time lag. We have recorded it already. We were aware of it. We started it. The bank hasn't had a chance to process it yet. That also goes on the bank side of the reconciliation, but this time it's in addition. When that deposit gets to the bank, they will add it to their balance, and we should too. The third item on the list, C, says the bank had collected 3120 on an interest-bearing note left for collection. The face amount of the note was 3000 So uh, a customer owes us, and we've given the note to the bank and told the customer to pay the bank directly. The customer does. We're unaware until we get the bank statement. This is a time lag. The bank knows about it and has processed it and recorded it, and we didn't know about it, and we need to process it. So now that we know, we'll write it on our side of the reconciliation as an addition. There's the $3,000 note, there's $120 in interest revenue that we were unaware of that we need to increase our cash account with. The next item on the list is D. The bank statement included a debit memo for printing cost for additional checks $40. We placed an order for checks for our company and the bank printed them for us. They charged us $40 for doing that. The bank has already deducted it from our account. This is a time lag. We have not recorded it. We need to. So we're going to subtract this on our side of the reconciliation. The $40 will reduce our bank balance. E, the next item on the list. The cash receipts journal and a deposit slip correctly indicated cash sales of $522. The bank credited the company's account for $552. Well, let's talk about the credited, the word credited. The bank sees things differently than we do. Cash is an asset to us and has a debit balance, is increased with a debit and decreased with a credit. But from the bank's perspective, our cash account on their books is a liability that liability has a credit balance. When they say they credited our account, they increased our account, and they did. They increased our account by $552 when it should have only been increased by $522. Errors and analysis and dealing with them might be the most difficult thing in this topic. Finding the error and correcting it involves two things. One, who made the mistake? and two, the direction of the correction. In this case, the problem says the bank made the mistake. We recorded it correctly as 522. The bank recorded it as 552. The bank is incorrect. We need to decrease this amount on the bank's records. We need to deduct this $30 difference in the deposit, the error that the bank made, and 
work toward having two reconciling items, have, having a, a bank statement that reconciles. I think that we're moving along to F. A check of $69 returned with the bank statement had been recorded erroneously in the cash payments journal as $96. The check was for the payment of the purchase of office supplies on account. With errors, we need to know two things. One, the direction of the correction, and two, who made the mistake. So in this case, it clearly says that we made the mistake. We made it when we recorded it in the cash payments journal. We looked at that check and wrote it down as $96. The check came back with the bank statement, and we can hold it in our hand and see the evidence that it really is for $69. The bank recorded it correctly. So the bank recorded our, reduced our account by $69. We reduced our account by $96. We've reduced our account too much. To correct this, since we made the mistake, we will need to add it to our side of the reconciliation. By adding this to our side of the reconciliation, we're one step closer to having a completed bank reconciliation. The difference in those two amounts, 96 and 69, is $27. We're going to add it to the depositor's side. I think we're on letter G. G says, a check drawn for $24 had been erroneously charged by the bank as $42. Well, let's talk about two vocabulary words here. Drawn. It's kind of like John Doe drawing. The owner put money in the business and the owner can take money out of the business and when the owner takes money out of the business, that's drawing it out. Thus the name John Doe drawing. Well, the same thing is true with a checking account or a savings account at the bank. We put the money there. It's our money. When we take the money out of there, the word is drawn. We draw it out. So when we complete a check, when we fill in all the things on the face of the check, that's drawing a check. We're drawing the money out. It says it was for $24, but it had been charged by the bank. In accounting, the word charged is a synonym for debited. The bank debited our account, and we had this discussion a moment ago. Our money to the bank is a liability. As they look at our money, they call it a liability. That liability has a credit balance. When we take our money out, it decreases our balance. They debited it. It says they charged it. Charged by the bank is $42. So again, this is a bank error. The bank reduced our account by $42, and we only reduced our account by $24, and we are right. So we need to add this back so that the bank's records will agree with our records. We're going to add this difference of $18. The two numbers again were 42 and 24. Do the math. It's an $18 difference and we're going to add that on the bank side of that reconciliation one step closer to a right answer. The final item here to analyze and think about is H. Bank service charges were $21.80. They are time lags. The bank knew about it. We didn't know about it. The bank has reduced our account already. We need to reduce our account by the $21.80. It goes on our side of the reconciliation as a deduction. So the completion of our analysis portion of this is four boxes with some additional information in each. We've arranged and kind of classified each of the changes on this bank reconciliation. And that actually is the hardest side. Now, taking these classified tidbits of information and rearranging it to complete the bank reconciliation is a pretty simple process because we've done the hard part. We've done the thinking. Let's do a bank reconciliation. Let's put a good heading on it, the name of the company, the name of the document, an appropriate date, it's a specific date. It's not a date that changes over time. It's not for the year ended or for the month ended. It's a specific date. And then let's look at each of the four areas that we talked about, the bank side and our side, increases and decreases, and write it in an acceptable, traditional way that others would find useful, beginning with additions. On the bank side, I don't know why, but we just seem to traditionally start with the bank side. If we started with our side, we'd still get to the same conclusion ultimately. It doesn't matter where we start. It, it is a tradition, it seems, that we start with 
the bank side. So let's write down the beginning balance according to the bank, $19,913.90. And to that, let's add the things that we've already discovered. Now, I wouldn't put the letters beside these. I only am putting them in this illustration to tie them to our analysis, to show you where more facts are available, to let you know that we decided this earlier. This was item B. It was a time lag. We had recorded the deposit already and the bank did not. We need to add it to the bank side, 49.45.20. The bank made an error. We discovered that that error should be added back to the bank side. The difference was $18. That was item G. The sum of those two things, 49.45.20 and $18, is 49.63.20. That sum should be added to the beginning balance, according to the bank, to reach the subtotal $24,877.10. Now let's consider some deductions. In our analysis, we found two deductions on the bank side. A time lag, outstanding checks, checks that we had processed that the bank had not, $7,070.10 and the error in the bank's deposit slip, as I recall. Item E, $30 was the difference. The sum of these two is $7,110.10. That sum should be deducted from the previous subtotal to get the adjusted balance according to the bank's records. Considering these things, we believe that the bank should have $17,770 in it. We're going to mentally set that number aside and begin again. We're going to start this time with the company side of the bank reconciliation and consider the additions and deductions that we need to make, hoping to come up with that same adjusted balance. Let's begin again. Now the squiggly lines that you're seeing on the video are to indicate that this is a missing amount, kind of like my dog ate this part or a torn sheet of paper. I wanted to make the image large enough that you could see it on the screen. So we're beginning right below what we just completed on the bank's records, this time from the depositor's point of view. The depositor's balance was $14,691.80 at the end of the month. We need to add some things and subtract some things. One of the things that we need to add is the note receivable and the interest that the bank collected from our customer. It was a time lag. We didn't know about it until we got the bank statement. 3000 for the note itself and $120 of interest revenue we need to record on our side of the reconciliation. There's an additional uh, an amount that we need to add and that was an error that we made in recording a check. It was for $27. It was in item F, as you recall. The sum of these three things, the note, the interest, and the correction of the error, is $3,147. That sum should be added to the beginning balance according to our records and get a subtotal of $17,838.80. We need to reduce that subtotal by some of the deductions. If you look back at our analysis on the right side in the deduction area, there were two items, printed checks and bank service charge. The printed checks were described in item D. They were $40. The bank service charge was mentioned in H. It was $21.80. I'm hoping you're seeing the benefit of the thinking and the analysis that we did earlier. It's making this part much, much easier. This sum, I bet you could do that one in your head. Why don't you try it? $40 plus $21.80 is $61.80. Deduct that amount, $61.80, from the previous subtotal, and the result is $17,777, the same number that we got when we did the bank side of the reconciliation. Reconcile means to take two balances that don't agree and to get them to agree, to get them to be the same thing. Explain all the reasons that they're not up to date and compare those two totals and we achieved that. 
$17,777 is the amount of cash that should be in the bank. It should be in our cash account in the general ledger. It should be on the trial balance. It should be on the balance sheet, ultimately. That's the amount of cash that we own today. Now, if you looked at the general ledger account for cash at this moment, it wouldn't be that. It would be the fourteen six ninety one eighty that we began with. It should be seventeen seven seventy seven, and the only way to get it there is to make some journal entries. If you look at the instructions, it says mm, prepare a bank reconciliation, and we did, and record the necessary entries in general journal form. As we look back over the completed bank reconciliation, it would be logical to start at the top and work down and just deal with every item. The fallacy of that is we don't make entries on the bank's records. We can ignore the upper half of the bank reconciliation. We only are concerned with making entries from our side of the reconciliation. It is the additions and the deductions that we have described on our side that require us to make journal entries. One approach would be to make one entry for every item listed there. That might be the easiest because the analysis doesn't uh, complicate one another. The extreme example, perhaps the worst way to do it, would be to make one journal entry for the whole thing at once. It takes a lot of thinking and figuring out how they interact. My preference is to make one entry for the additions and one entry for all the deductions. I think I'll illustrate it that way for you. If you look at just the additions section of the bank reconciliation and realize that these are additions to cash, therefore debits to cash, we want to debit cash for the 3147 total we determined on the bank reconciliation. We're lifting information off the bank reconciliation to make this journal entry. Debit cash 3147 and credit all the things that we listed on the bank reconciliation. The customer doesn't owe us the note any longer, we should credit notes receivable. We've earned some revenue, we should credit interest revenue for the $120. The check that we wrote was a payment on account. If we misstated the balance of cash, we also misstated the balance of accounts payable we need to go back and correct that as well. So this journal entry would increase accounts payable. We reduced it too much in the original error. You might want to go back and take a look at that and think about why it's accounts payable. We also need to make an entry for all the deductions that we've listed on the bank reconciliation. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are two. The deductions will decrease cash we need to credit cash for the total 6180 and we need to debit cash for some reasonable explanation for each of the items that we considered there paying for printed checks might be miscellaneous expense and the bank service charge might be miscellaneous expense we don't need to deb debit miscellaneous expense twice or make two different entries for this we can lump them all together and debit miscellaneous expense one time for 61.80. If you posted this debit and this credit that we've made in these two journal entries to the cash account in the general ledger, the balance of cash would now be $17,770 as it should be in the general ledger, on the trial balance, and ultimately on the balance sheet. We have reconciled the bank statement and we've recorded the necessary entries because of it. I hope this demonstration will be beneficial to you as you approach your first homework assignment. And I'm encouraging you to take the intermediate step, the middle step of analyzing all the things listed in the problem and making your decision about where you're going to put it in one of the four areas first before you begin your writing it down. It's either on the bank side as an addition or a subtraction or it's on the depositor side as an addition or a subtraction. Do that thinking first and it'll make preparing the bank reconciliation much, much easier for you. Have a great day.